thank you. Um, I am. Um, well, I don't know. Ooh, you like too. Thank you. Um, I think it's important when anyone presents and you're not familiar with someone that you that you have a chance to hear something personal about me. So I'd like to start with that, if you don't mind. Um, and it's because I often find connections. And I'll explain to you how I find connections to the work that you're doing. But first, I need to tell you about my connection to Milwaukee, which is going to sound incredibly convoluted, but it makes perfect sense to me. So I want to be clear about it. That is, um, so I'm a big baseball fan. And um, yeah. it's not going to be what it appears to be, so let's be careful. <laughs> don't anticipate. Come on, this is, I don't just convolute it, okay? And I've uh, been involved in rooting for baseball and since, and since I was a very young child uh, in the 1950s. And I, um, I grew up in the New York area, and at the time uh, when I was able to select a baseball team in a serious way was the year 1957. My mother wanted me to be a Brooklyn Dodgers fan, but sadly they went to Los Angeles at the same time that the Giants left New York as well. And so I was left to become a New York Yankee fan, which I'm proud of, and I am to this yeah. day. Yes. Now, please, anyway, yeah. someone. <laughs> There's more connection. So in 1957, the first World Series that I ever paid attention to when I was very, very young and I was able to watch it on TV, the New York Yankees lost to the Milwaukee Braves in seven games. Um, it was a painful experience for a very young baseball fan. And I all, and so to this day, I've had those bad feelings about uh, Milwaukee. In 1958, when I was a little older and more serious, the Yankees beat Milwaukee, so in four games again. So that was encouraging. Move forward to this year. Um, the Yankees were in the playoffs, and so are the Brewers. And um, the Yankees got eliminated by another team a little even farther north of where I live. And, um, obviously, a hostile crowd. I can't believe you brought me here with this hostility. Uh, but um, the and the Yankees were not going any further. And so here I am in Milwaukee, but interesting, the Milwaukee Brewers yesterday beat the Dodgers in the first game of seven. So it's all connected. <laughs> all right? So that's the point. That's the connection point. Um, but, um, but I want to tell you the connection between our work at Yale and, and you all, and that is um, rather simple and rather direct. Um, it might even be more so than you think, which is, um, I met some of you in New Haven a couple of years ago when we uh, did the conference there, and um, that conference um, solidified a point of view that I was developing that we could, at Yale, um, in our national policy work have an impact on a very specific topic. And um, what your workshop told me was that I didn't think there was enough, enough discussion nationally about, uh, within the broad field of music education, about the specific case for music programs in the great city district, school districts of America. That was number one. Um, and I'll talk about that more because I want to put it in a little bit of context. Um, the other thing that was made me happy and proud of that was that it was very clear from what you all saw and what I saw there that um, a group like you that I respect enormously uh, respected the partnership that Yale has with the New Haven Public Schools, um, with my good friend Ellen Moss in the back there, um, uh, and that helped us to understand uh, that I thought we could have a legitimate role in, to play in the national conversation. So it really was your conference in New Haven um, two years ago in fall that solidified the point of view that we could have um, some kind of impact on a conversation about why every child in every city in America deserves an active music life, which is what we ended up with. Um, I, 
How many of you knew this before you came? Knew of this before you came? Any of you? Some of you did. Um, how many of you read it from cover to cover and memorized it? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> I know. I know Tony has. <laughs> We've talked about it. But um, let me just very briefly tell you what it's about, because the point of a declaration, and then I want to get a bit more esoteric, and then I want to get a bit more general. So I'll, that's my the arc, arc of my presentation. Um, the declaration, what a declaration is, is it's a statement that says you must do this, okay? That's what a declaration does. I will tell you the original plan was to make it a manifesto, but the guys from the class of 1957 at Yale who fund our programs said, um, there's this other document that we're a little bit nervous about that uses the word manifesto. I wasn't nervous about it. I grew up you know, in the 60s with my hair down to here, and the Communist Manifesto was very comfortable. <laughs> for me, it, it wasn't so much for them, and so we, we came to a declaration which turned out to be brilliant because it allowed us uh, to frame it around um, very important work that I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, but to give you a frame of this, um, you know, you can see from the book, it's a small book, it's designed that way. Um, it doesn't answer every question, it doesn't give you every piece of research, it declares. And it declares eight things um, in there, right in the first page there. Every student in every city in America deserves access to a robust and active music life. Um, this call is animated by the values of dignity and inclusion. Um, an active music life affirms the dignity of individuals and communities. <laughs> the verbs we came up with were really fun. We decry. Well, we did. We decried the inequities that deny some city students access to an active music life. Then we said city students' access to an active music life requires the ongoing development of supportive music ecosystems, which we'll talk about in more detail in a minute. We call for all city students to have access to in-school music education taught by certified music teachers. We call for strategic partnerships that, um, with local organizations to expand and enrich cities' music ecosystems. And finally, we call for changes in the development, training, and support of music educators and teaching artists. Now, the book goes into more detail, although not definitive detail. It is a declaration. It is a document you should be able to put in front of a, of a school superintendent, you should be able to put in front of a mayor, you should be able to put in front of a governor, and they can understand what you're saying, and then you can make the case in the detail. Okay, so that's what it's about. That's the frame. I want to make sure that's enough that you understand, because we're going to talk about it um, after I'm done with my presentation. Okay. So, um, after I saw some of you in November, we, we definitively decided that we could, what I would say, thread the needle um, of discussion in such a way that we could talk about the needs of the cities of America without implying that there also are not needs throughout the infrastructure of music education. We could talk about cities while not implying that we don't care about everyone. As you know, most arts education advocacy presentations talk about arts for all. And of course, on the surface and under the surface, we agree with that. Um, I'm sure everybody feels that way here. However, the arts for all discussions have a tendency not to trickle down to the places that need them the most. Therefore, we decided to use our national symposium and the partnerships we developed through that symposium to highlight this one issue. Data shows music education is lacking most significantly in city schools. And while we don't think one declaration is gonna fix that, um, we felt we could create a roadmap for each city to look at the issues in a way specific um, to its own needs and do that without lessening the importance of music education for all. Um, but of course, the truth is, the most significant criticism we've gotten about the Declaration since it's gone out public, and it's gotten out through, you know, social media is amazing, this is, it is out everywhere, um, and it's being used all over the country, which is very encouraging to us. Most significant criticism is that somehow we're excluding rural schools, somehow we're, we're excluding suburban schools, we're not. 
We're allowed to talk about this one specific thing because cities are unique. Cities have amazing arts infrastructures, great community music schools, great orchestras, great jazz programs, great hip hop ensembles. That if you partner and be able, it's a different thing than if you're in rural parts of America. Which isn't to say we shouldn't have a similar declaration about music education in rural areas, but for all of us in this room, we get it. We get that this is what this has to be about, okay? And of course we don't denigrate um, other areas. But music education for all wasn't the purpose of this declaration. Make a, it was to make a very specific case that every child in every city in America deserves an active music life. Um, I talked to you a little bit about, the, about how we put this declaration together. I'll tell you a bit more. We invited um, 43 people to New Haven for two and a half days, and we spent a, about a year on either side of our <coughs> June 2017 symposium researching, writing, rewriting, sending out, arguing, disagreeing, and culminating in two and a half days in New Haven in which we had amazing conversations with leaders from all parts of what I would consider this city arts ecosystem, from foundation people, from music education people, from teachers, from supervisors of music, from people who run outside organizations, from um, people who, who care about urban policy, not just music um, educators. And we, we spent, for example, a whole afternoon talking about this concept of dignity. It was amazing. It was an amazing conversation, and it led us firmly to where we, where we ended up with this little, little book. By the way, I stole the idea of this little book, although not the content. Um, there's a, there was a book that came out um, right after the election, and this isn't a political statement, although it might again appear to be, which is, um, it was called On Tyranny. It was written by a Yale professor, and he, he after the election, he wrote a, a declaration, basically, and it kind of was this size and this simple. And I said, okay, we can, that's the model to use. It isn't to say we're talking about, about his issues. Um, and we spent, as I say, two and a half days um, batting around what ended up being this and uh, getting the support of the people around the table in that, in that great thing. It wasn't a symposium where we had lots of speakers. Everybody was an expert. We all sat around a big table and we patiently went through the issues that we had, we had drafted and changed them and created them and, and ended up with a group that supported the idea. And it extended out a lot more so that um, uh, places like uh, NAFME and the uh, College Music Society and um, the uh, National Guild of Community Schools are all promoting and supporting the work that is in, in the Declaration now. Lots of more organizations, but I don't need to, to go there. Um, so we worked through the differences, um, and it showed me that our field could agree on ideas, um, that we could get beyond schedules, finances, specific curricula, repertoire, control issues, lack of respect, all the things we all talk about and are real. Um, and they're usually pleasant, uh, present. Um, but we decided we needed to focus the goal in an idealistic way because it raises the conversation um, to a level that broader communities can understand. Um, um, it's idealistic for sure, but it's a goal and a method for city schools and music education. So why is it so important that every child in every city should have an active music life, access to an active music life? Of course, each of us in this room has the reasons why they feel that children deserve music programs, and I appreciate and value each of them. At base, we all know that no one can walk into a room with children actively engaged in music making like we saw a little while ago and not walk out understanding why music is important. Actually, we really don't have to say anything. But as a field, we have. Um, in the Declaration, we chose a rather simple argument to make. We argued that based on the values of human dignity and inclusion. Access to an active music life is a fundamental human right. Whoa. Let's pause to reflect on that just a bit. Usually our field does not make a broad and bold statement like that for fear that no one will believe us. We've traditionally tried to make arguments that you all know based on the intrinsic or extrinsic values of music. Um, 
intrinsic values of music uh, arguments are usually dismissed as esoteric, self-serving, irrelevant to society at large when so many other things are needed. And the extrinsic values, well, more often than not, they can be disproven. You know, improving test scores. Remember the Mozart effect? You know, um, or the blanket statement that music can, can you know, improve test scores, I said. We've spent at least 40 and probably longer years as a field trying to do research to prove one or other of these arguments. And the truth is, many people don't believe us. People see with their own eyes what it's like to have a great musical experience and what it does for children, but not enough systemically gets done. Okay, so from here on in my talk to you, I'm gonna talk about two basic things. One is very impractical, and the other is very practical, okay? Um, the impractical one is to talk to you about this concept of why we chose the argument we chose. And the practical one, which will lead into our conversations in a few minutes, um, is about the music ecosystem and about what I think you all can do in each of your communities to have a big impact. Um, so that's where I'm going to go, all right? So the impractical and the idealistic, exactly what Yale is supposed to do, right? <coughs> Get that on the way. <laughs> a warning. Uh, some of this part of my speech could sound political. Um, I suppose it is. Um, we're at a fascinating and kind of painful point in American history where we clearly have two sides. We have two sets of facts. We have two ideas of what's important, two ideas of how government and community works. Those two sides I would characterize without hopefully being pejorative to either are people who feel, on the one hand, that individual rights um, are the way to move the country forward. On the other side, people who feel empathy for others and who want equity, even if it may cost an individual something, even if it means that an individual's rights might be sub sublimated for the good of the whole. The Declaration definitely comes down from the second part of my bifurcated and perhaps simplistic world. We decided to justify an act of music life for all based on the values of dignity and inclusion. And over two years ago, as we started to do this, we looked back at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was written in 1948. We actually found it inspiring for the exact purpose that we wanted to do this. As you'll read in our declaration, three articles from this 1948 document frame our argument for equity in music. And I think it's important to understand this document and how it was intended to be used, the Universal Declaration, that is. After the devastation of World War II, the surviving governments worked to create the United Nations. And the declaration was an attempt to optimistically frame the future around basic human rights. The Declaration was not law, just like I don't think our Declaration is going to become law. But it was instead aspirational, which is why I think it survived for 60 years as a living document about humanity. Uh, the committee that crafted it was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, the beloved widow of President Franklin Roosevelt. And she didn't want to create law. She wanted to appeal to the brighter side of humanity after the horrible and inhumane war that had just ended. Move forward to today, and I think you should reread it now, or read it if you haven't read it. You can easily find it in line with what we are interested in. And it takes its universal words, words and I think we can relate them to our field. So I, I wanted to read a little bit from the Declaration. Bear with me. Um, Preamble says, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech, belief, freedom from fear and want, has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. 
Whereas it's essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Whereas it's essential to promote the friendly relations between nations, whereas the people of the United Nations have in the charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in large, larger freedom. Whereas member states have pledged themselves to achieve, in cooperation with the United Nations, the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of the greatest importance to the full realization of this pledge. So we can remember 1948, we can remember what's happened since then, we can understand that the Universal Declaration was a point in time and was very optimistic and very idealistic. Things happened that we now know that perhaps make the Declaration feel antiquated. But I'll tell you, in the last couple of years, it has been out and talked about in public discourse in America more than it has since that early period of 1948. Let me give you a few more words from that Universal Declaration. All human beings are born free and equal. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, security. No person shall be in slavery. No one shall be subjected to torture. Everyone has the right to an effective remedy. No one should be subject to arbitrary arrest. And it goes on and on from there. But then it talks about culture. Everybody has a right to culture. Everybody has a right to the arts. Everybody has a right to education. And that's where we said, OK, let's use this. And so it became um, a frame for us because it's a very high level thinking, optimistic document that everyone can understand. It's a declaration, um, but it is a declaration that's specific to, the, to our issue right now when we talk about our um, Yale Declaration. Um, lately, um, the Universal Declaration has appeared all over um, in, in American discourse. Um, in fact, I remember watching a TV show on um, NBC last year um, with a TV show on everyday racism, and um, Sherilyn Eiffel from uh, the NAACP quoted from it to bemoan police treatment of African American men in the cities of America, for example. I've heard it again and again in the media and in print. It's a very potent document, um, and as I said, it allowed us to frame um, what we were doing in our uh, document. So that, I hope, explains why we didn't talk about test scores, we didn't talk about um, you know, the, the, the other, you know, the, the values that we all have to talk about in our environments to make this work. We wanted to make an equally idealistic, but something everybody would understand. That if they, if they understand that, that human rights are an acceptable thing, well, arts and education, equity is equal. So that's very important to us in that. Okay, so now to the more practical stuff. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's in the Declaration is we talk about an ecosystem, and I think that's what we're gonna spend, um, after Anthony's presentation, we're gonna spend uh, our time talking about. Um, we feel very strongly that the, the, the 21st century cut of the success of an active music life for every child in every city in America is going to be not just based on what happens in the schools, it's going to have to be based on partnerships. Um, of course, we say every school needs a certified music teacher. Every school needs a certified music teacher in every in every case. Step one, that's the first part of it, right? Second part is outside organizations, and they need to have a big part in the conversation. They need it. It needs to be, and you know, we'll talk about this more as Anthony speaks. It needs to be done in an organized way. It needs to be done in a thoughtful way. There needs to be no argument that we're taking away jobs. It needs to be the opposite. Um, we're, we're fulfilling the ideals of the Declaration and the work that we all do. Um, but it requires each city to look seriously at all of its resources that they can bring to bear for this and start to think in a more organized way. Um, as an outside organization, 
we, a lot of our grad students participate with Ellen in the New Haven schools. And, you know, we, we have worked really hard in New Haven to make sure that the great community music school there and us and uh, there's a few other arts programs that go in. We coordinate because it's really easy to find the school that has the best principal, right? And all the, all the outside organizations want to go work there. And then where's equity, right? So we talk about the need in a serious way for each community, if you want to take this seriously, to, to spend some time organizing this. And that's the practical aspect of the declaration. We say, don't just let it happen. Um, make a case at the highest level you can with the most people that you can, which means it's not going to get done in a day and a half. And it's not going to get done when the first donor gives $50,000, right? It's going to get done when we've really thought about what we really need. And with the basic premise that every child deserves access to an active musical life, right? So that's the practical aspect of, of, the, of the declaration. And we don't talk too much about this because you have to think about it. I, and, and this is another thing that was criticized about the thing when it first came out, which is, okay, so why didn't you give everybody a roadmap? Well, the reason is Milwaukee is not New Haven. New Haven is not Norfolk. Norfolk is not, you know, oh, Every city has its own set of players. It's pretty simple, we all understand this. Go bring everybody together, bat your heads together for a few days like we did to create the declaration and come out with a citywide plan. And then bring it, bring, make sure you're bringing foundation people, uh, city leaders, uh, school leaders, um, families, um, people of note that should be involved in the process and get a plan. And you know, I'm not, this is not idealistic, this is happening. It's happening in cities across America where these conversations are occurring. They're hard to do. It would be easier not to do that. But if we really believe in every child and we really want to take advantage of cities who have amazing resources, then I think this is the way to go. And that's what the Declaration talks about in a practical way. Um, you know, I'm aware of how hard this is to do. I'm aware the systems, the leaders, the structures, the rules, make this seem completely impossible. As I said, it's happening in places across America. And I think the hard work of building an ecosystem model, not just one-off activities that fall into, into our laps, is the way for systemic change. Um, we've tried everything else 